What is up guys? I just finished my rotation in the intensive care unit and I want to talk about a fascinating disease that I'm learning more and more about. It's called hepatorenal syndrome. And as always, this video is for informational and educational purposes only. This is not medical advice. For any medical advice, make sure you consult your healthcare provider. So hepatorenal syndrome is essentially a kidney injury that's caused by a liver injury. Also, it took me way too long to figure out how to put those lightning bolts down. I am not a computer guy, so I hope you guys appreciated that. And I'm not talking about just any liver injury. I'm talking about cirrhosis. That's when the liver goes from being nice and smooth to all scarred and fibrotic, usually secondary to chronic injury from either alcohol or infection with viruses. Don't drink, kids. Now the liver is a very big organ and we use it for a lot of important things like breaking down drugs, detoxifying toxins, processing nutrients from our GI tract, storing vitamins, regulating blood sugar and hormones, and so much more. As a result, we have a lot of blood that goes through the liver for processing, especially from our gastrointestinal tract. Much of these organs are seen here. The circulation that we see here is called our splanchnic circulation and it eventually dumps into the portal vein, which goes right through the liver. And let's remember that word, splanchnic circulation, which is composed of the blood from the stomach, the small intestines, the colon, the spleen, the pancreas, all of which eventually dumps into the liver. So the liver is a big bloody organ, and when it becomes cirrhotic, this new deposit of fibrotic tissue will compress the structures within the liver, especially the blood vessels. So it's the cirrhosis and the physical compression of blood vessels that creates a resistance to flow. And this acts in concert with damaged liver endothelial cells, which help regulate blood flow in the liver, and decreased vasodilators within the liver, like nitrous oxide, and increased vasoconstrictors in the liver, like thromboxane A2. The end result is high pressures within the portal circulation. We call this portal hypertension. And think of this as a bunch of roads feeding into a superhighway. If the superhighway becomes clogged or blocked, this is going to result in a traffic backup into the splanchnic circulation. And for reasons that we don't entirely understand, these increased pressures within the portal venous system will trigger vasodilation within the splanchnic circulation. Different vasodilators, especially nitrous oxide, along with others like glucagon, adrenomedulin, uh, endogenous opiates, uh, prostacyclins, they'll all act on the splanchnic circulation to increase blood pooling and increase blood flow. And this even acts on the arterial side as well. So remember, we talked about the traffic jam that's happening here, and there's like a backup of blood into these different organs. And in addition, there's a vasodilation over here, right? So these vessels are becoming bigger. But at the same time, increased blood is being fed into the splanchnic circulation here. So to use our analogy of the traffic jam earlier, in addition to having congestion on this side, we're having more cars that are jumping off of this highway just to join in on the congestion as well and worsen the entire problem. We call this a state of hyperdynamic circulation, which maintains and aggravates the portal hypertensive syndrome. Now, instead of acting like a fast flowing river like our blood vessels should, instead the splanchnic circulation is acting more like a pool with blood just kind of sitting and pooling within the circulation and not really going anywhere. Now, because of this, blood is essentially being stolen away from our other organs. So our heart senses this and in an effort to compensate, it will increase its cardiac output by raising the heart rate and stroke volume. So the heart tries to fix the problem by pumping more blood forward, but this just worsens the problem because the blood ends up being shunted into the splanchnic circulation anyway. And while this might help our other organs a little bit, it just makes the hyperdynamic circulation even worse. If you made it this far into the video, Patty commends you. You have an excellent attention span. Congratulations. Okay, so at this point, our body is getting nervous and our sympathetic nervous system is starting to become activated. Our kidneys are also sensing low perfusion and low blood flow. So this, along with the sympathetic nervous system, will lead to the activation of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system within the kidneys. This has the end effect of bumping up our blood volume and bumping up our blood pressure by retaining more sodium and water. And the kidney thinks it's being a big shot by fixing everything, but then this extra fluid just ends up third spacing into the acidic fluid or even just worsening the hyperdynamic circulation. The kidney is already getting reduced perfusion due to this hyperdynamic circulation. This causes activation of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, and one of the hormones released is angiotensin-2. What you see here is the glomerulus, and I'll remind you that angiotensin-2 acts on the efferent arteriole of the kidney. This causes constriction of the efferent arteriole, which thus raises intracapillary pressure within the glomerulus, thus increasing or maintaining the GFR. 
but despite maintaining GFR, this will actually worsen the renal blood flow. It's so wild. There's this central theme of the body doing things to preserve itself in the short term at the cost of causing long-term problems. Eventually, you reach a tipping point where the blood flow to the kidneys becomes so reduced that they just can no longer properly function. This tipping point is usually triggered by some sort of acute insult to the body, such as peritonitis or a really bad infection, or maybe a huge volume of diuresis or acidic fluid removal, um, an upper GI bleed, things like that. Kidneys that are not functioning properly can lead to the buildup of ions in the blood, as well as acid-base disturbances, buildup of metabolic waste products like urea, all of which can potentially be deadly to a patient. The only definitive treatment for this syndrome is a liver transplant, which replaces the old cirrhotic liver with a hopefully healthy new liver that gets to the root cause of this problem, which is liver cirrhosis. Until you can get a liver transplant, treatment is mainly aimed at improving the health of kidneys, mostly by increasing their blood flow. Now, until you can get a liver transplant, there's really three ways that we can treat this. The first way is with volume expansion, usually with IV albumin. Patients with cirrhosis usually have a big problem with fluid leaking out of their blood vessels into space that it's not supposed to go to. One common place is into the belly. This is called ascites. This is because of those high pressures in their circulation that we talked about, as well as leaky vasculature secondary to inflammation. Not to mention with liver issues, they're not producing as much protein in their blood like albumin. Albumin is a great protein that helps attract fluid inside of our vessels via oncotic pressure. So by giving patients IV albumin, we can maybe restore their blood volume and prevent their blood volume from third spacing into other places like the peritoneal cavity. By keeping this blood intravascularly, we can potentially increase perfusion to the kidneys. Other drugs that can be given include drugs like norepinephrine, midodrin, and terlipressin. These are all drugs that, by one way or another, cause vasoconstriction and increased renal perfusion, as well as increasing blood volume. The last thing that we can do is we can give drugs that decrease splanchnic vasodilation, which I remind you is one of the stepwise causes of hepatorenal syndrome. Drugs like terlipressin and octreotide can do this. Terlipressin is actually a newer drug that's currently being used in Europe, not so much in the US, but there's a lot of exciting data that shows that it can become one of the mainstay treatments of hepatorenal syndrome in the future. The last way hepatorenal syndrome can be treated surgically is potentially with a transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt or a TIPS procedure. Using this surgical procedure to treat hepatorenal syndrome is actually somewhat controversial and an area of active research, and there's no definitive answer as to whether or not it should be used. This procedure creates a shunt that literally allows blood to skip the liver. Remember, the central problem of hepatorenal syndrome is that we have a cirrhotic liver that's causing portal vein hypertension and portal congestion. So going back to our traffic jam analogy, what if we can create a road that essentially bypasses this entire segment and it allows cars to, instead of getting congested, just drive around the whole situation? This, however, will come with its own set of problems with blood bypassing the liver. And if you'd like to learn more about this, I'd be glad to discuss it. So drop a comment down below. In conclusion, hepatorenal syndrome is kidney failure caused by liver disease. It carries a poor prognosis if it's not treated, typically being fatal in a matter of just a couple weeks. This is an active area of research with a lot of new exciting developments coming out, especially new drugs like terlipressin, which might help us treat this very difficult disease. And remember, this video is for educational purposes only, and this is not medical advice. Feel free to drop a comment if you have any cool questions regarding this fascinating disease.